Hello and welcome to the second Slow Ride Reviews podcast. This is Matt in beautiful Minneapolis. Just me this week. The other guys are off training, hoping to get a little revenge on me. I'm assuming it's Schwam again next year. Um, I am recording currently in my basement full of broken bike parts, also hoping to get a little revenge at Schwam again next year if things go as planned. Uh, this week I got to talk to uh, Daniel DVCA. Hopefully I pronounced that close to right, but he does correct me in the uh, interview coming up. Uh, he wrote a great book called The Comeback, Greg LeMond, The True King of American Cycling, and a Legendary Tour de France. Um, it was a great read, and I hope you really enjoyed the uh, interview. It's not the greatest audio quality. Um, it was just a Skype call that doesn't sound amazing. I'll admit that right up the front. But I still think uh, we had a good conversation, and he was great to talk to and had some good insights about uh, Le Monde and, most importantly, Fignon. So um, hope you enjoy, and um, stick around afterwards, and I'll say a few things more. How did you decide to write about... Le Mans, where you were you were a cycling fan from 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 his era. It wasn't something you came to recently. Yeah, well, so think about my perspective being that I was a, a mainstream kind of newsroom person. I was a, a newspaper reporter for many, many years. So I came out of kind of the mainstream of American journalism. And with that as my background, um, I knew that, like, there was no cycling reporter even at the New York Times, I don't know that they've ever had a full-time year-round cycling correspondent. And mm-hmm. and and if you go back again to Greg LeMond's era and to Armstrong's era, there were people writing about the, those guys for the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe and the Chicago Tribune and the Austin American Statesman. But even that off generally wasn't like a full-time job for anyone. So it's a really niche part of journalism and journalism was my world. Okay. So Mm -hmm. I was, I was, so I was thinking of what could I write that would be a compelling book that would have wonderful narrative conflict in it. And, you know, one day walking around my neighborhood, it occurred to me that this Le Mans thing from 89 was just amazing and had all the ingredients of the best, like narrative nonfiction, like, like Seabiscuit or, or Moneyball or like the boys in the boat. Uh, that 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 uh, rowing book, um, just amazing conflict, like you know, guy against guy, you know, guy against the entire nation of France, you know, guy against like death, and just amazing conflicts that this character had overcome. And then and then again, I'm a news guy, so I was thinking, who in the mainstream of American journalism would do that book? And like no one, I mean, there, I, it didn't. I just couldn't think of anybody because in yeah. in sort of middle of the road mainstream. American journalism, that's my world. There, it, there's just no one doing it. Um, so that was kind of what emboldened me to take it on. I, I was figuring there's nobody else in the States who's going to do that book. Yeah. Um, and, and nobody, and indeed, nobody had done a comprehensive bio of Greg LeMond since Sam Apt in 1990, so, which is almost 30 years, right? Um, yeah. Now, s- since I leapt into this, I now know there's a bunch of really great cycling journalists. A um, whole, whole bunch of them are in uh, Colorado, uh, in Boulder, in fact, like if, if Boulder, like, like vanished from the face of the earth, you'd lose <laughs> most of them. But yeah, probably. And, and they're really, really good. Um, they're really good writers. They're almost all former racers. <laughs> Some of them are current racers, um, which is really different from my world. Cause in journalism, like, again, like the Washington Post, where I used to work, the baseball writer is not a former baseball player, yeah. Yeah. but this is a, it's a niche thing. And they're great, and I'm kind of, in, in hindsight, really grateful that none of those people set out to do the same book because they could have done it different from me, maybe better, maybe worse, worse but it would have been really different. But they didn't. For whatever reason, nobody had, had sort of, you know, uh, taken dibs on that book, and so I was able to do it, and um, I'm very grateful. Yeah, you mentioned the the, what, the Sam Samuel Abbott book from – from, yeah, like 30 years ago, and and really before you, before like we became in contact and learned about your book, I, I hadn't thought about the fact that there hadn't been a Le Mans book in that long, which is really crazy because so much of this story is so compelling, and I knew a lot of it, but there was so much in here that 
little bits I didn't, I'd never heard, and so much of piecing it together that was really a joy to read. Well, well, thanks. Um, you know, the the Le Mans story, like pieces of it are out there. The 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 slaying the badger book, which is pretty widely known in in America, um, tells does a wonderful job of telling part of his story, uh, and it's. It's, you know, it's the part that I watched when I was in like high school and getting into college, which is him, him being the first American to win the tour and really facing off against all of France. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's a great story. But, but it, you know, um, Richard Moore, the writer of that book, wrote a blurb on my book and pointed out that this, my book is the first one to kind of go beyond that because Sam couldn't because it was 1990. Um, and to really go all the way forward to now. And, to, and, 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 and into what I think is the greatest tour. Um, yes. Uh, uh, you know, the 1989 tour. And, and, and people listening to this who are fans of the tour going way back, it would be hard to disagree with, with that. I mean, it's hard to find another tour like that, like the 1989, that decided by eight, eight seconds. I mean, it's insane. You know? Yeah, I, it's definitely. And I, I don't know if I told you this when we were first emailing, but is definitely uh, watching a video of the '89 tour was definitely the thing that hooked me on cycling. So this was oh nice early nice. 2000s, but but sort sort of getting into cycling and then found a VHS highlight of of the tour of the '89 tour at the library here, and that was definitely the thing that hooked me on cycling and hooked me on this Le Mans Fignon rivalry, which um, I guess. No, it's not the only focus of your book, but like you go into a lot of their careers sort of paralleling each other in terms of rise and fall and injury, and then yeah. both making this comeback in 89 and, and then having this amazing race. Well, um, well, you know, first of all, I, I don't want to patronize you. You're younger, but that's amazing that you did that. And <laughs> I, I was, dude, I was there. I mean, I, my father and I, my father was a, was a bicycle racer from Belgium okay. and he and I, it was like our baseball. Like we would go to the races every Thursday out of the velodrome. And when the race across America began in 1982, I think it was, we were watching that on TV. When the tour started being broadcast in the States, we were watching it and we would record it. And so like by 83, 84, 85, we were, we would watch it, you know, the little packages of it when it would be on TV. And so 89, like we were primed. I mean, we, we recorded it. I, I've actually compared notes with some people who, like me, kind of watched it that day. And I don't think any of us knew what was going to happen. And I'm referring here, of course, to that final time trial, the eight yeah. seconds thing. I don't think we knew um, because it was like that. It was that day. It was happening that day. And back in 89, it wasn't easy to, to find stuff like that out. It wasn't oh, like yeah. go to like WashingtonPost.com and it would be like a banner headline, which it wouldn't be anyway even now because nobody would care. Yeah. Um, it's such a niche thing, but no, we didn't know. So it was, it took our breath away. I mean, I can promise you. I imagine, did you, I guess in terms of 89, did you have to, did you get to watch the show the last stage live or did you have to wait for like a half a week for the tape delay or something on you know, CBS Wild World of Sports or something? <laughs> Do you remember? I, I, sh I should know this, but oh, it was, sorry. it was packaged in like the weekend broadcast. And so probably what you're seeing when you watch it on YouTube, probably the, 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 the rest of the week had been packaged into a segment really nicely yeah. produced. And then probably the actual, finale i have to assume if it wasn't live it was maybe had just happened maybe a few hours earlier and i i'm ashamed that i don't know this for sure it's okay but it sure came across like it was happening right then and i don't think i know anybody who said oh yeah i knew how it was going to come out and five million households american households watched that and that's a big effing number because yeah. i don't think as many households have watched any of the of Lance's victories, and this is not to take anything away from Lance. Uh, it's more diffuse now. Like there's a zillion channels, but in '89 there was like three, and so everybody, I mean, lots and lots and lots of people watched that, and they were all just completely blown away by it. Well, yeah, it's obviously um, it's such a compelling story, but just such a component of of. Greg Lamont's story from, from, and you go into this a lot in the book, his youth, his coming to, his transition to Europe, but, um, 
what I was really surprised at the book was how much, how popular Le Mans was in France when he was like first, uh, on the Renault team and stuff and how, how popular he was there almost in comparison to how Fignon was after he <laughs> initially started, uh, winning tours and Greg was still hadn't quite gotten to that height yet. It, this is kind of weird, but but he was l'American and he was beloved. Um, you know, he's a lovable guy. I mean, there's a few people out there who rant and rave, and, and for whatever reason, he rubs them the wrong way. But most people, <laughs> going back to the beginning of his career, thought he was lovable and adorable. And the French adored him. You know, unlike Lance, unlike Lance, Greg really, I think, tried to embrace the language and the culture and tried to endear himself. You know, Lance was always his own guy. But Greg, I think, tried to endear himself to the French, and he did. He succeeded wild, beyond his wildest hopes. And, and, and Fignon, who, gentle listeners, I will remind you, was kind of the last great French cyclist. Um, I don't mean that what he did was like after the great Hino, because Hino was the last French guy to win the tour, but he was older. And Fignon was younger. Fignon was the young Turk who was basically the last French person to emerge. Who, who would become a, a, a world-class number one cyclist. So Fignon won the tour in 83 and 84, but he was regarded as a, as a petulant guy. And if you read, uh, actually Sam App did a really nice job explaining that Fignon wasn't like most French cyclists. As a, as a, as a rule, French cyclists back then, and probably even today, are uh, uh, you know polite, shy, reserved, humble, <laughs> Um, pretty nice, pretty likable, pretty lovable. Fignon wasn't French. He was Parisian. <laughs> so that's yeah. different. He was like, I, I compare him to like the surly French bistro waiter. He was yeah. aloof, a little arrogant, um, blunt, you know, pl- uh, very plain spoken and, uh, could really rub people the wrong way. And he did not handle fame well at all. So the media actually did not like him very much, at least early on. And, and he would win. He won the Prix Citron. I'm saying that wrong. The Lemon Prize, even in '89, as the most petulant writer in the, in the peloton. Yeah, so he. There were a lot of people who really had a hard time with him, especially camera crews. He had a real problem with camera crews and was always spitting at them and pushing them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so, great. It's weird. It's, it's the opposite of what you'd expect. He was he was the one who had to fight for the love in France. Well, yeah, and especially uh, my coming up really wa- getting to watch the tour live in the Lance era. And it was, it was very much flipped by the time um, I, I really got into the sport, whereas the Americans were not as loved as much. And they were, the French were hoping uh, with all their hope that another French star like, like Fignon would emerge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, the, I guess I'm bringing it back to Fignon cause he's always one of my favorites and the other two hosts of the show, Tim and Spencer aren't here to uh, direct me away from him, but I just really got to say, I really love, uh, enjoyed the bits just, you know, you pairing, uh, Fignon's struggles and triumphs with Le Mans struggles and triumphs and how, how they were kind of on the same trajectory there for a, a bit, uh, toward the oh, yeah, mid eighties. Yeah, yeah. As far as my narrative, he's the main foil um, to, to Greg, and I, I treat them both, I think, as protagonists. I mean, they're both great heroes, but but L- Laurent Fignon is the foil to Le Monde um, at the at the peak of Greg's career, and so I do entire chapters on uh, Fignon, and nobody in the in the states knows diddly squat about Fignon. I mean, I think one of the obituaries when he died had like the wrong picture, you know. I mean, oh, really? he, he was oh, that little good. little known in this country. Um, and, and some few people have read his memoir um, in English, and it's it's there. You can buy it. It's great, but not many. And so a, a lot of the reviews I've gotten, like like the fellow who reviewed it for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Leonard Zinn, um, pointed out that he himself knew a lot about Greg. Sorry, the train's rolling by here. Um, he, he, Zinn knew a, a lot about Greg, but but less about Fignon. And and he pointed out in his review in the Wall Street Journal that wow, I really felt like I learned a lot about Fignon, the great Fignon, from reading this book. Stuff I didn't know before. And it's not like I revealed any great secrets. I mean, I interviewed people close to him, childhood friends, you know, ex-wife, widow, um, his soigné, best friend, you know. So I got great stuff. But um, a lot of what's in my book is simply what's in his memoir. That very few Americans have read, you know, and but it's revelatory to people who think they know everything about that era. They they probably don't, you know, and, yeah. and, and I, I hope I hope I can surprise them. <laughs> oh, it definitely surprised me. I I think 
the narrative from a lot of folks I've uh, known and talked talked about cycling with through the years has been like that Le Mans was he brought the aero bars in and he won by eight seconds and he was this uh, innovator and that Fignon wasn't in it. He was this sort of stodgy old uh, older bit of European cycling and Le Mans sort of brashly came in and, and beat this old school guy. But the one thing you brought about uh, Fignon was that he started his own team after the Renault team ended and that him and his director, like, they, they started a new model for the team in terms of, of the way to finance the team and a way to run the team and that they own the team. And, and I didn't know that. That was a very interesting bit for me. Yeah. So um, the Guimard and uh, Fignon business model uh, apparently became kind of the norm um, that that no longer did the sponsor call all of the shots but that instead the, the, these two guys would run the team and would simply sort of rent out space on their jerseys to the sponsor, and it sort of turned the business model upside down, and apparently that became the standard. So it's yeah. just as important of a business development, I think, as Greg and Bob Lamont, Greg's father, mm -hmm. um, sort of uh, revolutionizing the pay structure, which, which also yes. happened in that decade. And, and more people know about that in the States, that Greg was the first million-dollar guy in cycling, I think he was even earning more than he know uh, for a while there, and it was it took a little while, but the rest of the industry caught up to that model, and it was thanks to Greg, I think, that you ended up having million dollar cyclists, you know, a plenty later in the decade and into the nineties. Yeah, I was impressed uh, just even for current terms for some of the figures that uh, Mom was making. Um, you know, there's a few cyclists that make that kind of money even now, but there's a lot that don't, even at the highest level, that make considerably less. Um, so he was he was very well paid there at the, at the peak of his career, which he definitely deserved. But it was impressive how he, um, him and his dad, uh, were able to advocate for him. Yeah, they were sense. coming out of the perspective of American athletes like Mike Schmidt in baseball or Dr. J in basketball, that those people were earning big money. And it was predicated on the idea that their careers would be finite. And so you have to pack an entire lifetime of earnings into a few years if you're a football or baseball player. And that mindset was what steered Bob. And it's right, you know, it's correct. But in cycling, it was this, it was this blue collar sport and they would pay them nothing and, and get away with it because nobody had really questioned that system. Yeah, which is, I mean, there's been so much uh, recent cycling stuff with the with the, the cyclist union and stuff, and yeah, they they definitely all deserve a little bit more. But it was it was really interesting to read about, yeah, the 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 pay structure before and kind of post uh, Greg coming in and kind of shaking it up. Um, what I want to ask you a quick, a couple quick opinion questions, just of your own opinion. Not from the book, but what's your favorite um, Finian design jersey? Because I know you mentioned in there that he, he designed the System U, and I think he had a hand in the Castorama one as well. Do you have a favorite there? Oh, gosh. I, I remember I was really smitten with the Super U, uh, with the System U team um, in 89. Um, I remember because, again, I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, entering into that race, that just seemed like a superhuman team. They looked like gods. And and they rode with this mechanized precision. If you remember the team time trial from early in that tour in '89, they just looked like they were yeah. reinventing the sport. And that's a pretty nifty jersey uh, with the, I think it had a big red U and and it, and, they, and it, it incorporated elements of I think the old uh, uh, Renault design, the yellow. Uh, it, that was pretty nifty, and they just looked really dynamite. And it's it's sad, I guess, in a way that Pignon lost because. Had he won, it would have been a triumph of another great cycling team, you know. And Greg's yeah. team, of course, was just, I don't want to say bad stuff. I interviewed a couple of the people on the team, but it was it was not a, a really, really competitive team. Um, it was kind of, I think it was kind of put together with, you know, smoke and mirrors to some extent. And so the fact that Greg won at all is kind of amazing because certainly Lance Armstrong never competed on a mediocre team, right? Um, yeah. And Greg did, I mean... I mean, if you think about it, 86, and I'm getting inside baseball here, but in 86, he was on a team that was basically working against him. Yeah. And in, and in 80, 89, he was on a team that had nobody who could keep up with him in the mountains at all. Um, and yet he won both those years. So that says something about him. Yeah, it definitely says a lot. Um, 
And and eighty nine is just a crazy tour, just because you also have Delgado missing his start time and and changing, you know, him mm-hmm. kind of being out of it, his start time in the yeah. time trial, but also just sort of changing the dynamics of the race, and that he was he was sort of free to go on crazy attacks half the time, and uh, it's just a it's just. If anyone hasn't watched it, they really need to watch bits of that race. It is an amazing uh, addition. But as far as jerseys, you know that uh, that uh, a Viclair jersey is kind of uh, yeah. I mean, that's the ultimate fashion statement, isn't it? With the, with the really symmetrical, good. artsy designs. I saw some of uh, what's his name, Mondrian. I'm going to say his name wrong. Uh, that painter's work in the National Gallery in Washington, and it's it's cool. It's just like the jerseys. <laughs> That's great. Uh, they probably can tell all the cycling f- fans that come in and say, I've oh, seen yeah. that jersey, you know. Yeah. Um, the, and then later on in the book, you get into at least post-89, kind of 90, 91, 92, how both Fignon and, and LeMond run into the EPO era. And I mean, I knew a lot of that and I and I. And I knew how much both of their results had tapered off. But when I first got into cycling and was just watching those videos, I didn't know. And it was kind of, it was bizarre to watch the 89 one and then pop in the 92 one and be like, where'd everybody go? It was a yeah. drastic change in the Peloton. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't interrupt you, but. Um, no, no. Yeah. So what, what my theory is, is that our heroes, uh, Fignon and Lamont, I think they're both heroes were just as strong and they were putting in the same like speeds behind the motor pacer you know they were just as powerful basically had the same bodies and and could do the same stuff on their bikes um and yet uh suddenly they could no longer keep up and and even domestiques of their own era people as old as greg and laurent were like sweeping past them in the in the tour and the tour itself was being run at a faster clip i i I mentioned that in the book it got a little faster each year and so uh, both of them seemed honestly bewildered as to what was happening. Apparently, there was, you know, there were whispers of new, this new drug. But remember, there was new stuff kind of getting into the sport every every so often. And maybe maybe they didn't take it seriously because the, the dope, such as it was in the 80s and in the 70s, was not in any way decisive. It wouldn't turn you into a champion, you know. It, couldn't tra- it wasn't transformative. But they claim that neither of them really even knew that it was happening. And... Again, you can go back and tease apart all these different reports and also go back and look at who confessed to what when. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that I think EPO w- began to appear at the end of the 80s, maybe around 90, 91, but maybe only a few competitors in the tour were using it. Now, cynics would look at Indurain's performance and would yeah. say that if you look at Indurain and the difference between what he was doing in 88, 89, and 90, and then what he was capable of in 91 and beyond, that that right there is probative of something. Um, now, there, I don't think there's ever been any uh, ev- any hard evidence that he was doing anything. But if, if he was, well, that right there kind of shows this transformation in an athlete. Um, and I think I read in the New York Times that his uh, VO2 max was 78 or something. So, you know. Oh, really? And and but that because people were so enamored of of him, and, and I loved him. He was a great great champion. Um, yeah. that, that 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 all just got forgotten, or nobody bothered to ask what his what his actual numbers were. Um, yeah. but I'm I'm getting beside the point. The point being that Greg Laurent Fignon, Andy Hampston, and some of our other heroes uh, could not keep up anymore, and so they faded and they and they retired all of them. Yeah, it was a pretty drastic change. It is funny how um, Indrian kind of uh, he does he just doesn't get the same sort of um, accusations against him or same he gets more love for a cyclist from that era than a lot of people that uh, have a lot of suspicion around them. He's just somehow able to just not not be hated in ways that some cyclists are <laughs> but i don't i don't know what that is that says well, about I, him. maybe it's just being nice unlike I, I, in the was, same way that lance is hated now and he's just not nice so well i mean part, part of that is it, we're in america and and lance was massively popular in the states and most of his fans didn't really understand the sport very well and they were all they all felt horribly betrayed when he admitted that he was doing what let's just say this that most of the <laughs> GC yeah. contenders were doing, and he couldn't understand how, why they were so upset. But most of his fans 
just didn't get any of this. And I think they all just assumed he was telling the truth when he said he wasn't joking. <laughs> so with Indurain, first of all, he's Spanish. And a lot of us stopped watching the tour in the States in the 90s. And he was humble and soft-spoken and didn't mm -hmm. bluster and boast. And uh, But I will tell you this, dude. Um, I've, I've, I've sat with a lot of you know, experienced, knowledgeable veteran cycling writers over the last few months. I mean, I, I've, I've broken bread or shared a beer with a bunch of them. And apparently it's a really big topic now in, in that field, mm. that niche, that may be wondering whether someday, and again, I'm not saying that Miguel Indurain did anything, but if he did, that maybe someday he will acknowledge it. And if he does, yeah. that might be a game changer, maybe, in terms of, moving the whole doping conversation the next step forward. Apparently that's a big deal, but you won't read about it anywhere because it's still kind of a taboo topic, weirdly enough, you know, in, yeah. in the cycling journals. You no, know, it is. And it, I mean, that that makes sense. I, it's, yeah, it's hard. I mean, yeah, I don't want to uh, make accusations against him either, but it is hard to believe in that early 90s era that he could uh, dominate as much as he did and pretty much everybody who was within shouting distance of him um we know something about it at this point or uh, you know so well, and, and yeah and, and cer certain teams um uh, the, the team that was known as pdm um yeah. i mean i think it's telling about greg that greg left that team and then in in 89 which is the next year there's a big article in the la times saying greg lamond left pdm because they wanted him to dope mm -hmm. i don't i don't wow, think greg crazy. would be saying all of that if he had been if he'd been doping, right? Doing um, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not like any other article you're going to read from 1989 about any cyclist. Um, he, Greg is saying in the LA Times in the sports section that this team was trying to make him dope. <laughs> wow. And, and then I think that's amazing. In, yeah, and I think it's in 91 that there's this big thing with the PDM team where they all got sick from eating fish or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, something like else. Yeah, you know, and we find out later that uh, half, you know, a bunch of people on the team admitted to this and that, and so yeah, certain teams, certain maybe certain nations, you know, uh, competitors from certain places. I, I think Holland came up. I think maybe Italy came up, maybe Spain, and then you know, then you get to a point in the later into the '90s where a lot, a lot, a lot of the writers are doing it, but um, you know, our, our heroes are gone from the peloton by then. Yeah, unfortunately, so. Um... Well, the book is called, I was to say, the book is called The Comeback, Greg LeVon, The True King of American Cycling and a Legendary Tour de France. And I got to say, there's a little bit of a, a, a snipe at Lance there in the, in the title of the book, um, feels well, like. But, it, it, but it's nothing that you, 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 you hardcore cycling fans all agree to that, don't you? I mean, oh, there, totally. There's, there's nobody totally. writing a headline saying, there's no, I mean, there's nobody who would dispute that there is now one person who's an American Tour de France winner. I mean, that is just simple fact. So I, it's a, it's yeah. a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a tweak. But you know, yeah. I mean, the book has to. I want to, I want, I want people to pay attention um, to this. And I, and I, but the book itself, let me just stress, I meant, I, I honestly meant for it to be, and I, I think it is a celebratory, a celebratory oh, book yes. to see. take all of us back to a really happy happy, joyous, innocent, dare I say, time in cycling when it was, I mean, think about that experience you had in the library with that videotape. I yeah. mean, we were all really friggin' happy, and it was just this wonderful sport. It was like breaking away that movie. You know, it was a wonderful time for this sport, and I, I would love for people to go back and just immerse themselves in that joy um, one more time, you know, because you guys deserve it. I mean, with the, what the sport has been through, Everybody deserves a little bit of, of, of happy nostalgia. <laughs> well, that is that's a very good way, I think, um, a good note to end on. Um, I'm going to probably butcher your name now, but the book is The Comeback by Daniel de Vizier. Yeah, de Vizier. There's a, a uh, town in Belgium called Vizier, and my father and his kin were from there, and they, they immigrated here from, from Brussels in the 30s. And then they rode their bicycles across the country because they were lunatics, so really? they were they were the first competitors in the first unofficial race across America. You should say. Across America. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. Um, do you have uh, anything anything you want to plug or website, social media? Oh like, God, cool thank you. Um, you know, if you Google uh, "comeback book Le Monde, uh you'll probably find it. Um, my website is my name, Daniel Devise. Um The book was reviewed in the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Seattle Times. You can find those reviews online. But um, yeah, the reason I'm 
that I'm extremely grateful to you for interviewing me is that with a book, it's just hard to it's hard to let people know about it. It's just hard. It's not like a movie, right? It's not at the multiplex. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to make sure as many people who would like it <laughs> find out about it because I think it's a good read. I think you guys will enjoy it. It's got all of the great kind of narrative conflict that you study in English class. I mean, ups and downs like you wouldn't believe. And so I yeah. think it's a, it's a worthy read. Oh, I, I thought it was a great book and I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I learned a lot. There's a, there was, a, I thought I knew, I thought I knew a lot about, uh, the 89 tour and, and Lamont Fignon, uh, you know, their, their careers, but I, I learned a ton. It was a great read, so thanks very much. No, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. So since it's just me this week, and I don't have those other two guys to uh, point me in the right direction, keep me uh, on task, I figured I'd start a new segment on the review show called Off the Bike, because I don't have any other bike parts to review right now. Pretty much everything I have is partially broken, and that's just not a great review. So, my off-the-bike review, and it's a short one for this week. And it turns out it's the 20th anniversary of this very thing. I was going to recommend, for your post-cross-race drive home. Now, don't listen to this beforehand, or you'll have a very poor race. You'll be too mellow and blissed out. I was going to recommend the 1998 album by Edith Frost, Telescopic. Nice, sweet, smooth jams. Turns out it came out almost exactly 20 years ago, uh, too, as I'm recording this. So I am officially old, but I can't think of anything better on a fall day to fall asleep to, uh, kind of blissed out, knowing you got that uh, top 10 place, and that cross race you really wanted. Just make sure your driver has plenty of coffee, and everything should go as planned. And with that, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully we'll be back with one of these and we'll be back with a regular Slow Ride podcast sometime soon in your feed when we all get over our post-Japan Cup hangovers. Thanks. Thanks.